this will uh, not focus only on privatization and commercialization but also include a lot of you know overlapping issues of um, equity uh, social justice cost recovery and several other uh, aspects so primarily uh, to start with privatization uh, the definition kaise karenge usko define kaise karenge so uh, uh, if we if we define it primarily it would be uh, a mechanism that gives a private player control of any part of the water system so it could be service uh, delivery it could be billing it could be operations and maintenance so that would be something uh, you know uh, which could which could be controlled by a, a private player uh, yeah uh, that's that's we feel that 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 could be something which could be called privatization and then uh, there would be uh, something called uh, an arrangement uh, where you know water is being treated as a commodity so, so uh, primarily uh, water becomes a commodity that can be you know bought and sold and um, uh, the the major concern uh, becomes uh, the profits of 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 that particular entity to you know uh, sell and buy water privatization has been in existence since long we have caste based uh, exclusion of water resources that is very evident especially in the rural areas um, then groundwater which is owned by the the owner of the land uh, we have groundwater markets like in you know chennai and other places um, tanker supply is 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 a privatized uh, and then it is mostly uh, you know uh, done through individuals and unorganized sector but uh, these had influences in pockets and were limited within you know specific regions or areas or villages so it was not a widespread kind of a, uh, a issue but uh, after the 1990s we are seeing a new wave a new kind of a, a trend uh, in privatization where we have uh, primarily the involvement of large corporates uh, huge uh, multinational companies coming into uh, water business and you know uh, trying to uh, provide water service to to the residents to citizens and then um, you know trying to generate profit from from that kind of a service uh, uh primarily uh, uh, if you look at it into uh, both the aspects macro and micro in macro terms we didn't have a policy which really forced you know and pushed and you know uh, said uh, 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 i mean took into a certain direction to you know uh, have private participation into into uh, what as a, yeah and then in in the macro terms uh, there were pockets where you know you have uh, that kind of a uh, limited uh, that kind of a um, uh, Uh, influence where you know water resources were controlled by certain sections certain castes or certain you know um, set of uh, communities but in general uh, there were access to sources where uh, you know people can get water from other 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 sources of uh, of water but then uh, this was not um, in the sense totally exclusive if we have um, uh, on the contrary if we see that you know water uh, are being commoditized and you know uh, being um, uh, used as a commodity for profits then we can uh, see that it's it, it's going to be really difficult for people who can't pay to be really out of the system okay so uh, with a new wave we have uh, large corporates the the private multi multinational companies coming into and now uh, the domestic uh, water companies as well uh, into into you know water services and uh, they have uh, the ability you know and the arrangements of you know controlling water systems and resources these were uh, initially you know uh, in the in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, driven by the international financial uh, Uh, institutions like the world bank and the adb and uh, overseas development agencies like dfid but mostly after jnnurm and uh, domestic reform programs uh, these have been quite a lot internalized into into the domestic policies but i 
sci-fi influence is still there in, in, in the policy making uh, arena. And then uh, with the new wave, uh, uh, we have uh, also this uh, that we just discussed about the, the policy push of, of the international agencies and uh, this, this is, this is ma majorly done through you know, the knowledge creation kind of, a, kind of a aspect which backs the, the, the privatization agenda. And it follows the global trends of, you know, privatization in Latin America, in Europe, uh, in, in Southeast Asia and, uh, and other countries. If you look at the, the, the new wave, this primarily comes from, uh, there's something called uh, a Dublin conference and uh, the Rio Earth Summit that was organized in 1992. Uh, I think some of us would know about this. Uh, this uh, these two um, highlighted actually uh, the idea of the recognition of water as an economic good and um, it having as a you know economic value and then the agenda 21 uh, of the uh, Rio Earth Summit uh, this refers to water as a scarce uh, vulnerable resource and condition of widespread scarcity of water. There were other uh, aspects as well. There was IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, which was, which was there. And then participation was there and uh, several other things. There were four actually key principles. But th this uh, economic prim uh, principle I'm highlighting because uh, economic, uh, water is an economic good uh, and the, uh, the condition of you know, uh, scarcity. These formulations have been used by international financial institutions like the World Bank to push uh, uh, water markets, privatization, and water sector reforms in the third world countries. This is the water as an economic good has an importance in that context. So uh, uh, we are looking at privatization uh, in in all these sectors, including you know bottled water, urban water supply, irrigation, and industrial water supply. Um, the, these are some of the uh, uh, projects that that were you know initiated in in. in this radio was water limited was uh, was the earliest one in in India, which was the privatization of Shivnath River in Chhattisgarh, and uh, the Neera Deoghar project in Maharashtra, which is for uh, ir irrigation purposes. Now we come to the justification. Uh, somebody asked the question about the logic of privatization. So uh, the justification of privatization, given you know, uh, in general terms, it's about to begin with the failure of public systems. Uh, the, the lack of investments, you know, that the governments are not able to bring uh, cheaper tariffs that the private companies would bring in better services, latest technology, increased efficiency, reduced corruption, and increasing water scarcity. Okay, so in India, if you have a look at uh, briefly at the, the progress of privatization, how it began initially, as I mentioned already, there was direct privatization in Shivnath, but it had, you know, it faced. Uh, this happened in nine, two early 2000. Early 2000. Huh? Early 2000. Early 2000 in, in Chhattisgarh, in, on Shivnath River. The whole river was, uh, 23 kilometer stretch of the river was, was privatized and given to a private company for industrial water supply to uh, um, a particular industrial estate close to, in, in Chhattisgarh. Uh, a 23 kilometer stretch of the river was privatized uh, to this particular company called Radius Water Limited, which, ha which had uh, political connections. And uh, uh, that reservoir, which was created by that company, was used to supply water to, uh, there is this industrial estate close to Raipur, which is called Borai Industrial Estate. And uh, that company was charging something around 23, 23 rup rupees per kiloliter for, for water supply uh, to the industries. Uh, that stretch uh, was blocked for the local communities. They can't, uh, you know, uh, get water for uh, drinking, for cattle, for other other livelihood needs. And it was uh, fully occupied and, you know, fenced by that private company uh, and controlled uh, for its own uh, profits. And then uh, later on, we had a, a long struggle, and um, in fact, Ch Chhattisgarh government uh, constituted a public accounts committee of the legislature, and it did a detailed investigation and uh, sent a recommendation of uh, to the to the government to cancel the the project, and you know, uh, because it's not it was against the public sentiment, and it was really um, hampering the, the the public objectives, and in fact, the local communities were really 
harden to you know get water in 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 in, in that stretch of the river so that that is it it's it's no officially officially it was recommended to be disbanded but it's still ongoing uh, i think uh, again uh, let's see how much in detail we can go into the shivnath project but the shivnath project represents all you know very interesting parts of the privatization debate so the one of the justification for privatization is that the state doesn't have a, uh, money to invest so the idea was this company would come in build that small anikat on the shivnath uh, shivnath river and then uh, you know supply the water to the industry but now you must remember that a private see i think the basic issue with a privatization project is that uh, the basic interest of the private company is profits i think it's a character it's a nature of that uh, organization or, a, or of an entity i'm not saying it's good or bad it's the basic nature so they are interested in their profit and they are interested in their profit so they want to uh, cut down all the risks and this is a very very critical element in any privatization uh, sort of process where when the agreement is signed with a private company how the de-risking is done and this de-risking actually leads to a lot of problems so one of the interesting parts is of what is called as a the private company said that okay we'll put the dam and you know supply water to the industry but uh, you know we are putting in all this money so you must take a minimum quantity of water every month so this is what is typically called a take or take pay clause where either you take that much water from us or you anyway still pay us for that so in the case of shivnath project the whole project was for 12 mld 12 million liters per day water supply to the state it was mediated by the chatisgarh state industrial development corporation so the chatisgarh state industrial development corporation runs the borai industrial estate near dur they gave this project to radius they were the buyers and they would make it available to the industries as a kind of you know state incentive for encouraging industrialization so out of the 12 mld 4 mld was a take or pay so whether you take 4 mld or not you have to pay for 4 mld for many years and i believe i'm not i don't have the latest information but even now it has not reached that level of use in the mm -hmm. in the industry but they still have to pay keep paying that so that's one part and in fact this is also very interesting the whole uh, logic part of the logic of privatization is that a private entrepreneur makes profit because he or she takes risks the profit is justified because of the risk they take but here there is no risk there is no risk and in fact you will find this a recurring element in all private contracts if you look at the various elements of a private public agreement i believe or we believe that based on our sort of understanding that there is a fundamental contradiction between the interests of a private company and of wherever water is used as a social good and that fundamental contradiction prevents you from making a creating a contract which will be satisfied to both that is my basic contention now in the shivnath case apart from this aspect if you look at the ramifications for the resource okay just to take that point which came in now first of all the moment they put the anikat there and build that they said this 23 kilometers of reservoir is our this thing now of course it is legally there is no legal sort of right which the government gave them okay but this was done through both sort of you know um uh, uh, because they had political contracts they have muscle power they are strong they started bro beating the villages and then as gaurav mentioned when there was a lot of struggle around that because people were not allowed to bay not allowed to fish not allowed to take small little crops they were taking on the banks of the river there was a lot of agitation ultimately as a part of some compromise some of those uses were have been allowed okay so but that was after some struggle but the other interesting thing is that that contract actually says that the water which will be taken from the anikat and supplied to the industry 12 mld so at any point of time particularly in the lean season it is the responsibility of the government to make available that water from the upstream reservoirs and discharge it and make it available to them so what has happened is that in privatizing it okay for the industrial water supply you have earmarked some part of the resource for that so this is the backward ramifications for the uh resource Resources. linkages so i mean this is the kind of debate which raises there now is there any way in which you could have this contract without such a responsibility on the state if the state said that no whatever water we have we will first reserve it for drinking water then for livelihoods then for ecological flows and only then we'll give you then i guess the industry will not be interested in this to bring in a sort of a cross linkage just to give you an example of how this type of things work in the another very big 
uh, the biggest sort of privatization project of water supply in this country, Tirupur, where the Tirupur industrial estate is to be supplied uh, water, again picking it up from there, they have a very interesting mechanism called the water scarcity fund, where if there is scarcity of water in the river and they are not able to supply water to the industry because of that, then of course they lose the profits for that month, that will be made up from that fund and which will be replenished by the government, right? That's the kind of thing. So, you know, the, there are linkages to the reservoir, uh, to the resource. The second issue is that uh, we should, should also have in some of which yesterday came up that uh, there are certain biophysical properties of the water as a resource which, in which market may not be the best player in this because uh, you know, any for a classical market system to work, you need certain constancy of the resource which water does not have. It is much more a variable resource. It does not have that type of legal and other type of property regimes to back up all lot of things. So, I think so. It is a resource like unlike land, where you know market it can be an instrument in allocations, buying and selling at both things. So, I think water is not uh, amenable to such type of interest. So, we need to take that into account. Uh, at both at the social plane as well as at a biophysical level key, whether we can treat water, uh, you know, as a freely, uh, you know, this type of thing which uh, privatization or commodification can do.